I, I initially had it as high fidelity, but I figured that was kind of nondescript. So high Reynolds number, uh, computational error optics, explains a little bit more of what we're doing and why it's difficult to do. And as I said, my name's Ed Matthews. Uh, my collaborators on this project uh, was, is Can Wong, who's a postdoc in our group, and my advisor is Meng Wong and Eric Jumper. And I'd like to thank the, the, uh, the NSF and Blue Waters, this support, this, uh, project was totally supported through the uh, Blue Waters Graduate Fellowship, um, and the, the crew at NCSA have been great. Um, my point of contact, Tom Corsese, has been there to answer all of my random questions about trying to get stuff running on the machine. So uh, the first question is, what is aero optics? Uh, in short, aero optics is the distortion of an optical beam uh, that's caused by turbulent compressible flow. So you can see over here, this is, uh, where is that? Uh, you have this initial beam that has a distribution, intensity distribution. And before we shoot it through some, some turbulence, it's initially collimated and the wavefront is flat. And if it projects through an air optical distortion, which is caused by a change in the index of refraction, uh, which is related to the density of the turbulent field, you get a really big aberration, a drop in the intensity uh, and the, the coherence of the beam in the far field. So you can just compare these and look at it. The farther we go out, uh, the worse it gets. And while the non-aberrated beam generally looks the same. Uh, and this is obviously a major impediment to things uh, where you'd have an airborne optical system. If you're going to shoot a laser between two planes, a ground to a plane, uh, to increase the, the, the communication speed. And this also has some implications in imaging, targeting, and directed energy systems. <coughs> So our goal is to use CFD, uh, which everybody should be semi-familiar now with after the past two talks, to, uh, to improve our understanding and our predictive capability for aero optic systems at realistic Reynolds number and Mach numbers. So I think everybody's kind of had it hammered in. Uh, the importance of Reynolds numbers and fluid flows, uh, it just gives a, uh, the, how small the scales and turbulence gets when it increases compared to larger scales. And then the Mach number, everybody I think is pretty familiar with, where it's just the speed that the air is going, or the fluid is going, compared to the speed of sound. Uh, in particular, we are doing this to be able, there's a large amount of data on, on aero optics from uh, the Aero Optical Laboratory at Notre Dame, where there's two planes that fly uh, around Michigan. Uh, one is a source plane that shoots a laser at the other one, which has a, a turret mounted to it, which is like a, a hemisphere with a cylinder on top of it. And then they measure the aero optical distortion uh, of that laser. And so we can get an idea of where, in certain angles, you're looking at it. This is a kind of complicated flow. And then uh, it's kind of moving towards how can we work this out? How can we develop aero optic mitigation techniques? Uh, and so what I'm going to present, I've uh, been working on the past year is the largest aero optics calculations to date. And I'm um, going to talk a little bit more about wall modeled LES, but it's so far the highest Reynolds number of wall modeled LES. Uh, and I've used over 200 million control volumes. So computational aero optics is, uh, is, has challenges because you have to, to capture all the optically relevant flow scales. Luckily, though, uh, Ali Manny and all in a, a JCP paper showed that this could be fulfilled by adequately resolved uh, large eddy simulation. So large eddy simulation solves the navier stokes continuity and energy equations, but it's spatially filtered. So the smallest scales of the turbulence aren't resolved, and everything below that on the computational mesh is modeled. Uh, this also, you know, the keeping on with the high Reynolds number, uh, it gets pretty cost prohibitive with high fidelity CFD, especially in wall bounded flows. So to do DNS on a wall bounded flow, it scales almost more than two and a half to the power of the length of the plate on the Reynolds number. The, for a wall resolved LES, uh, which I explained earlier is just a spatial filtered uh, Navier Stokes, it scales a little bit less than the Reynolds number based on the length of the plate squared. But if we were only going to resolve the outer scales of the boundary layer, it actually scales linearly with the Reynolds number. So to be able to, to make problems that are of engineering importance feasible, uh, we use a wall model. So what a wall model does is it solves a simplified version of Navier-Stokes equations called the thin boundary layer equations on an embedded mesh. So in the LES mesh in the outer part, we don't have the resolution to get the inner scales of the wall, but we employ a separate mesh that does have the resolution, and we use a simplified version 
of the Navier-Stokes equations to approximate that as a boundary condition. So the LES mesh serves as, uh, it provides outer boundary conditions to this mesh, and then the uh, simplified thin boundary layer equations is solved in there and it gets returned as uh, boundary conditions. So in only resolving the outer scales of the boundary layer, the LES at large Reynolds numbers becomes feasible, uh, where before we could never do it in several years. <laughs> so the full solver that I'm using is an unstructured mesh solver. Uh, it's compressible LES code called Charles that was developed at Cascade Technologies, which is a, a spin-off of some work that was done at Stanford in the Center for Turbulence Research. It uses a, a low dissipative finite volume scheme for the spatial discretization. Uh, and that combines a central flux uh, with an upwind flux. So upwind flux will provide some computational stability in regions with really complex geometries that normally would blow up with a central scheme. Uh, but this upwind is only added in areas where the mesh is skewed. So that kind of you know, adds to the design phase where in CFD generating a mesh is usually pretty difficult in a long part of your uh, CFD cycle. Uh, but, you know, it's really on you and you can check how much it's adding to it to make sure that you're not adding dissipation where th the turbulence is important. Uh, formally, it's second order, but uh, it's fourth order in regions with a uniform Cartesian grid, uh, which is, you know, with unstructured uh, methods, having higher order is an ongoing problem. In time, uh, we use third order uh, explicit time marching or Runge-Kutta method. Uh, and then the subgrid scale stress light I was talking about uh, that you use in LAS. Uh, is a Ryman model. Uh, and then this code is, uh, is parallelized using MPI solely. So just going over what the simulation domain for some of the stuff I'm about to show is we have a, uh, the mesh is 15D, with D is the diameter of the turret, where the turret, like I said, is a cylinder with a hemisphere mounted on top. Uh, and then this kind of, this profile here is the inlet condition, which we use a mean turbulent boundary layer profile uh, that's one-tenth of the diameter of the turret, and this is based off of some wind tunnel experiments that were done at Notre Dame. And the assumption that we're making here is that the inlet boundary layer profile is really thin compared to the area of interest with that are, that's optically uh, active. So it doesn't have a, a huge effect on the optics if we use a mean profile instead of uh, supplying an unsteady uh, turbulent profile from a, another simulation. Um, so the wall model that I described before is applied on these walls and the, uh, the turret surface. Uh, here, this kind of shaded region is what we call a sponge region. It's a numerical sponge that absorbs uh, acoustic and uh, vortical structures so they don't reflect back inwards and contaminate the solution. Um, this is also because it to be able to damp these out, it takes a running average and then adds a source term to the right-hand side of the equations to, to eliminate them. We also use this as the outflow condition uh, for the top and the outflow right here. Uh, in the span-wise, the flow is periodic, um, and the domain, it's 10 wide in the span-wise direction, and then five, uh, five diameters tall. And it, like I said earlier, we use uh, 200.5 million control volumes. So the optics solver, uh, this is what I put in. Um, to compute the optics, uh, we have to use a separate beam grid for every single viewing angle that we want to look at because we're using geometric optics uh, to project this, this beam outward. So this is the OPL. Um, this is a, uh, the optical path length. Because the, uh, because the optic aberrations is almost completely in the phase component, uh, it can be described by, by integrating out here and using geometric optics. Um, another one that we use is called the OPD, which uh, is the average, the mean, the spatial mean removed OPL, which will uh, kind of give you a relative phase distortion of the, the wave front. So each grid extends about 2D out from the turret surface, so it encompasses the entire uh, optically uh, active region. And then at each time step when the optics are calculated, the density gets interpolated from the LES mesh onto the optical beam mesh. Uh, then the index of refraction is calculated, and then we integrate outwards. Uh, and then I parallelize this by, I break the beams into wherever it's found locally, and then the, that gets integrated, the points on there, and then I bring it all in together with the collective communication. So the optic solver, you can kind of see the initialization where we find all the points, we set up all the integration bounds, and we do uh, pretty much just setting up the problem. It's pretty insensitive to the number of cores I use. 
But the optics uh, kind of stalls out around, I think that's, I should have made these sticks a little bit better. Um, this is around like 8,000 cores. Uh, I think this is due to communication. I got an idea of how to fix this. Uh, it's not really the writing because I just write each wavefront out and they're really small uh, by each core that kind of, that it belongs to. I think it's due to, I'm using the, those collective communications which is spanning all the cores instead of just the ones that uh, are, have beams on them. Um, with Blue Waters, this is one of the big reasons why Blue Waters are nice, because the machine has a lot of memory and we can do a lot of this I.O. work. We're able to solve for nearly 300 viewing angles that cover the entire uh, viewing area. So each beam contains about five and a half million points, and in each time the optics are calculated, over 1.5 billion points are interpolated and integrated. So in all, with all these different angles, we generated around a terabyte of optical data. And then here's you know, a nice little movie. It looks like a jellyfish. Uh, so this is Lambda 2. This is a, a vortex identification uh, value. I don't know how. It's kind of a, a complicated formation, I mean a formula for it. Um, so this is, blue structures denote uh, more, co more coherent vortices, and then the red are, um, are, are weaker vortices. And then so you can see on the front, this is what we call a, a horseshoe or a necklace vortex that forms at the junction uh, where the, the turret meets the wall. And then there's also, you can't see it in this one as good, but there's some rotational uh, things that are happening here. And that can be really well visualized with using, uh, this is the, the fluctuating pressure. So what I do is I take temporal fields and then I take out the mean, the, the time mean. So this will give you the, uh, the time varying uh, structures in the wake. So these is the, this is the pressure. So these kind of identify vortex cores. Um, this is a little bit lower than the mean, by where you'd expect the core to be a lower mean, uh, I mean a lower pressure. And then I colored it using the, the, the fluctuating density, uh, which is done in the same way where you remove the time mean. And then that's the, the density is what's responsible for the aero optics aberrations. So you can see that it forms really strong vortex separation off of the, uh, the cylindrical part of the turret. And then these kind of start wrapping up over the top. They kind of they bend in. Uh, and it's pretty cool every once in a while you can see that you get this core of a vortex that just sits in here. Uh, it's, it's, it's its own entity and then these things just keep on convecting, they go down. And there's even, there's some kind of coherence in between when they shed. You know, so there's a lot of stuff going on in here that is dying to be studied. Uh, so this is the streamlines of the time average velocity and then here is a, a diagram from some experimental work uh, that, you know, this is what they've, they've seen in the experiments. And then we see something similar, you know, the flow that comes in here, a lot of it get wrapped, if it's close to the base, it gets wrapped up into this necklace vortex, and I'm sorry, this is colored by the, uh, the, uh, the velocity magnitude. And the stuff that goes over the top gets pulled into this recirculation zone where you can see the velocity is low, and then it eventually kind of spirals out into these, uh, these horn vortices, as they, they're called. And just comparing to some experimental results, uh, so this is a wind tunnel test, the little boxes, and then this is our CP curve along the center line. And uh, and then we have pretty good agreement, uh, you know, where you get a peak here around like 85, and then the separation is right about uh, 110, 115. So this is the, the optics uh, important uh, parameter. So this is the, the fluctuating density, where red here is a higher region of density, and then the, the blue is lower. And you can see a lot of the similar structures that you see in the pressure, because the, the pressure is the, the driver, at least in the separated shear layer, to, uh, to drive these aero-optical distortions. Uh, if you have a wall, usually they're kind of driven by temperature uh, and other structures in the outer boundary layer. Um, but so what this does, um, if it will go to the next slide. So this is kind of the same thing but a movie of what happens to the optics. You know, this is the initial beam distribution. Then it gets projected through this, where this is looking further back into the wake. And then you can see what this does. This is a near field intensity pattern got from uh, doing Fresnel diffraction uh, up to 16,000 D. Uh, and you can see the bands in here, just kind of like you see over here. And then you can see this. And then the farther back you look, the worse it gets. By the time here, this is what initially looked like this is almost totally non coherent. Uh, this is a measure of the optical distortion uh, that we look at a lot of times because you can kind of, uh, there's, uh, there's an equation in a, that, was, that you can use to kind of predict the far field intensity based on the OPD RMS, which is the, the, the relevant, I mean, the, the, 
the relative phase distortion uh, of a wave front, the R spatial RMS, and is normalized. Uh, so you can see that we, we, we capture a similar trend. We're a little bit underneath um, you know, the experimental, manage experimental measurements, but there's kind of large error bars there. Um, and then I haven't had a time to do a, another simulation yet uh, with a coarser mesh to kind of look at how our results compare uh, with its, uh, the mesh dependence. But this is from a, another simulation I did that was at the fifth of the, the cell count and a fifth of the Reynolds number. And then you can see we actually have pretty good uh, agreement in the optical distortion. And then we kind of know that there's some insensitivity to Reynolds number as you get larger because it, it depends on the coherence of the vortices and the density RMS. Uh, and then so if your largest scales are set by your largest you know, entity in your flow, namely the diameter of the turret, you shouldn't have that much difference as long as the flow is past a critical number. Um, and so the future work, and I think this is where Blue Waters is really going to shine, is uh, processing the over 40 terabytes of flow field data that I generated uh, in optical data and trying to use, uh, beyond just classical statistic approaches, using some data mining methods like uh, POD, uh, proper orthogonal decomposition, it's usually called in, in fluid dynamics, but this is really just principal component analysis and SVD, um, and then dynamic mode decomposition. And then a lot of these, uh, you know, these are kind of important in studies of uh, experimentalists use these methods a lot to kind of look at turbulence. And nothing really works beyond MATLAB for them. You know, the SVD on your laptop is pretty much the farthest that experimentalists or even some CFD people go when it comes to doing these methods. So having something that people could use that's geared towards fluid dynamics would be nice. This is kind of like a little diagram of what POD does. Uh, you know, you have this wave front that's spatially and temporally evolving, uh, and then it breaks it into some spatial modes, this uh, spectral that depends on how uh, much variance each one of these modes contain, and then you can have these temporal parts of it. So thank you. That's it. So, right. So the the the, the question is, did I oh, did I uh, couple it in with the the solver? Which yes, I did. Um, so I wanted to get a higher uh, time resolution of the optics than I did when I dumped out this and generated this 40 terabytes. Uh, so I ran it and I did it on the fly. Uh, it was point zero 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 five five convective time units. Um, <laughs> it's kind of I'm trying to think of it. It's it's small because it's a it's a what's it called? It's a it's a explicit time marching. So the the, the time scales of the the steps are going to be pretty small compared to something that's implicit. Uh, so, so I am using the, uh, the equilibrium wall model. So the, the other ones that have, I'm sorry, the question is, am I using the equilibrium wall model or am I using like a full set of the, the thin turbulent boundary layer equations? Like there's been a lot of study with that going on. So I did use the equilibrium and that has had some problem with, the, with accurately doing the separation, which could have an effect, but there's still getting it to scale well with the full ones. Like I think recently the, the physics of fluids paper that uh, was uh, I think Park and Moen, where they that's kind of I think the last one I can think of uh, where they solved that full equation. Um, I think it's still kind of it's really expensive compared to doing just the ODD the ODE wall model. So we are, yeah we're still using this. We're there's actually another guy in our group named Mohammed. Uh, Kamel, who's looking into aero optics and uh, wall modeling and kind of seeing how they interact and what's the, the best way to go forward with that. 